Well, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I wanted to first start off by saying that um, there's few people outside of my own institutions that have been more supportive of my career than Sony Smith. I consider her to be a colleague, friend, and valued mentor. Um, but I've been asked to do a job this morning, and so um, unfortunately, in this case, she's on the wrong side of the argument. Um, so we'll talk about why obinutuzumab is superior to rituximab in lymphoma. And like many things in lymphoma, there's certainly nuance, but I think um, there's pretty good support uh, for this position. So these are my disclosures. So I want to first start off by talking about the significant impact that rituximab has had on the landscape of, of B-cell lymphomas. And so whether it's been used in induction, in the relapse setting, uh, as maintenance or consolidation, it's clearly changed the way that we manage lymphoma uh, and has markedly improved outcomes for patients uh, with, with B-cell malignancies. And so that, in my mind, is not really up for debate. I think the value of CD20 directed antibody therapy is, is clear in lymphoma, uh, and this is just a representative study uh, of CHOP versus RCHOP in large cell lymphoma, which, which highlights this. However, rituximab, I would argue, is old news at this point. It's been around now for 20 or so years. Um, and this is a, a, a slide from actually a really uh, nice review um, from uh, British Columbia looking at the differences between obinutuzumab and rituximab. And I'm certainly not an immunologist, um, uh, but uh, the key here is just to highlight the fact that these are different drugs. Even though they may both target CD20, uh, they act uh, in different ways. And there's some areas where obinutuzumab uh, is felt to be stronger uh, than rituximab uh, in targeting CD20 positive uh, cells. So uh, at least where I come from in Atlanta, college football is, uh, is, is huge. Uh, and for many years, as many of you may know, one of the biggest challenges in college football was that uh, the polls were often determined based on the opinion of writers, uh, based on what they had seen. Uh, but there were, it was infrequent that you really had head-to-head -head matchups to determine the championships. Well, fortunately, in this debate, we have a number of head-to-head -head matchups uh, between obinutuzumab and rituximab across a variety of, of settings. And uh, we'll go over the data quickly, but uh, I think the key, is, it, the key to see here is that this is a question that has been evaluated in a number of settings and, in my opinion, has been answered uh, through randomized studies. So the first study we'll talk about is this study, which was a single-agent study of benetuzumab versus rituximab in patients uh, with uh, relapsed uh, indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And as you can see from the table at the bottom, uh, the majority of the patients uh, had follicular uh, lymphoma. Uh, and so you can see here there was uh, about 75 patients in each arm. I would point out uh, that as opposed to the next study I'll discuss, these were patients uh, that were felt to potentially still be responsive to rituximab. Uh, they had, uh, had had to have responded for at least six months since their prior rituximab dose. So these were patients that were more likely to respond. Uh, but despite that, you see that the overall response rate with obinutuzumab is higher, and the CR rate is also higher. And then if you look at just those patients before you get to the maintenance, but just the, at the end of induction, there's also a higher response rate. Now, I'm sure we'll probably see this slide again in just a little bit, um, but you can see that there was no significant difference here in progression-free survival uh, when using a single agent, uh, the single-agent antibody. Uh, but I think what this study shows us is that you, have, you at least have a better chance of getting somebody into remission uh, using obinutuzumab. Um, and I think if you talk to any of your patients, they certainly would rather be in complete remission as opposed to, to not. Um, again, I wouldn't use this as the only reason to use obinutuzumab versus rituximab, uh, but certainly it's a suggestion uh, that the response rate is higher and that it, even in those patients that are felt to be rituximab sensitive. So uh, the Gadolin study was the study that led to uh, one of the first, uh, or the first uh, FDA approval for obinutuzumab and follicular lymphoma. Uh, and this was a study that, as opposed to the prior study, this study uh, included patients that were felt to be refractory to rituximab, uh, so that they were not felt to, uh, to, to benefit from additional rituximab moving forward. And for that reason, uh, the randomization was obinutuzumab bendamustine uh, versus bendamustine alone. Uh, and the inclusion criteria for this study did allow prior bendamustine, but they couldn't have received it uh, within a defined period of time prior to enrolling on the study. Um, and so one of the criticisms of the study that we may hear later is that it did not include uh, an antibody in this arm. Uh, but again, I would highlight the fact that these were patients that were felt to no longer benefit from rituximab uh, as part of their therapy. And so patients received uh, obinutuzumab bendamustine and then would uh, move on to obinutuzumab maintenance. Uh, 
what we can see here is that, and this is from data that's been uh, more recently updated in Journal of Clinical Oncology, that the median progression-free survival uh, is nearly double for those patients that receive the combination. Uh, and if you look at the time to next treatment, that's a significant uh, improvement. Uh, and for many patients, again, whether or not we even get into overall survival, the fact that they're able to go for over a, well over a year to almost two years longer without having to receive treat, a, a new treatment, uh, in my opinion, is certainly clinically meaningful and justifies use of this antibody. So these are uh, updated curves from the uh, most recent JCO publication. Uh, and so you can see on the left are the uh, progression-free survival curves, uh, in the middle are overall survival, uh, and on the right is the time to next treatment, uh, and the entire intention to treat population is on top, and the follicular lymphoma uh, patients are on the bottom. Uh, and you can see that there is uh, improvement across the board uh, by incorporating obinutuzumab. Uh, but again, I, I think, I mean, first of all, we see that overall survival appears to be better, but this time to next treatment is a very significant improvement, again, in my opinion. Uh, and, and especially for patients with relapsed uh, follicular lymphoma certainly justifies its use in this setting. So we've talked a little bit about the, the use of this uh, antibody in the relapse setting, but what about in the frontline setting? Uh, and so the Gallium study uh, evaluated this question, and it was a fairly simple design that patients received uh, obinutuzumab or rituximab uh, in combination with chemotherapy of choice. And there were uh, three primary regimens that were uh, utilized. Uh, and these were patients that had high tumor burden, uh, so stage three or four disease or bulky stage two disease, uh, and included some patients even up to a performance status of, of two. So especially for follicular lymphoma, these are patients with pretty significant disease. Uh, and these are the uh, progression-free survival and overall survival curve. And as you can see, uh, even in the frontline setting, uh, compared to rituximab-based chemotherapy, which I would add is a, ver is a very high bar to beat. So uh, our chemo has, uh, the overwhelming majority of patients with our chemo will stay in remission for a long time. But adding obinutuzumab improved the progression-free survival at three years uh, by 7%. Uh, and as we've learned more in recent years about the importance of, of, of not being an early progressor uh, in follicular lymphoma, I think uh, any significant improvement uh, is important. Um, I would concede that there was no significant difference uh, so far in overall survival. I think some of this speaks to the fact that the majority of patients with follicular lymphoma are going to live for a long time, uh, and so it will be hard to really see an overall survival benefit for patients uh, based on their frontline therapy. And then I would just take a minute to talk about overall survival. We often think about that as being uh, potentially the most important endpoint. Um, but I would argue that there's a number of commonly employed therapies uh, without an overall survival benefit uh, from a prospective randomized trial. So maintenance rituximab and follicular lymphoma may not be used in, every, in all patients, but certainly is used frequently. No, over, no clear overall survival benefit. Um, BR is frequently used in indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma compared, uh, as opposed to RCHOP. Again, there are significant improvements there, but not necessarily an overall survival benefit. Uh, autotransplant and first remission uh, is something that is frequently used. Uh, the randomized study, which was uh, published now 13 years ago, uh, didn't necessarily show an overall survival benefit, yet uh, this is frequently employed um, in this setting. And then the post-transplant uh, brentuximab uh which we commonly use for patients with high-risk relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma, also frequently employed. Uh, without necessarily an overall survival benefit. And so I think overall survival is clearly important uh, and, and is a meaningful endpoint, but I would argue that there are a number of other meaningful endpoints, and most patients, I think, would, refer, would prefer to be in remission than not. Uh, and I, and I, as, as a result, I think improving the response rate is important, and improving remission duration is clinically meaningful, even if it doesn't ultimately tra uh, transfer to an overall survival benefit. So certainly we have to talk about Goya, which is, I would argue, the outlier. And this was a study for uh, patients with untreated uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, where patients were randomized uh, between obinutuzumab CHOP uh, versus R-CHOP. And this was a large study. Uh, and as you can see from the, from the uh, three-year progression-free survival, this ended up being a negative study. And it was felt that this did not represent an improvement over R-CHOP. And, and in fact, there were some increased toxicities, including neutropenia and infusion-related rea reactions with obinutuzumab. And I'm not prepared to stand up here and tell you that based on this, you should still use obinutuzumab over rituximab in this particular setting. Uh, but I would say that there's not really any harm in going up against our or any, any shame in going up against our CHOP. 
Um, there's pretty good uh, company uh, with other regimens that have been evaluated. Uh, we also recently heard over the summer about uh, an RCHOP by Brutnip study that we may hear about later this year at ASH. Um, and so there are a number of other uh, uh, regimens that have gone up against RCHOP and unfortunately uh, have not surpassed it. However, I would caution you with the interpretation of these uh, frontline uh, large cell lymphoma studies. And this is one of the things that's different between large cell and follicular lymphoma is as you know, those patients that present with much more aggressive disease that are in the hospital or that may not necessarily be able to refer, be referred for a study are those patients that have high risk aggressive behaving disease and can't necessarily wait to go through screening. And so the patients that often get enrolled on studies are not necessarily real world patients. And so again, I, I'm not here to tell you that you should use obinutuzumab CHOP for frontline large cell lymphoma, but I would encourage you to interpret these results with caution uh, because in a number of other settings we have seen that obinutuzumab is superior to rituximab. Okay, so in conclusion, there are nu numerous large randomized trials that support the use of obinutuzumab in lymphoma across numerous settings. So this is a situation where it's already been settled on the field. We don't have to speculate. You know, we just heard before about the RATHL approach to um, Hodgkin lymphoma as opposed to BVAVD, and unfortunately those haven't been compared head to head, so we really just have to um, speculate from a number of different studies and try to put that together. Here we actually have the studies that have been designed to help us answer those questions. None of the studies that I presented have suggested inferior outcomes with obinutuzumab. Uh, so I don't think that you're in a situation where you're going to have a patient have less of a response or less of a response duration because you've used obinutuzumab. Again, I would caution that randomized trials in large cell lymphoma are fraught with enrollment challenges. Fortunately, there are a number of new approaches, uh, including potentially allowing patients to, to start therapy before going on study for one cycle just to get their disease under control and then potentially having them enroll onto study. I think that will help us uh, get a more realistic picture of patients. Uh, in the Goya study, for example, 85 plus percent of patients had a performance status of zero or one, uh, which I would argue is not typically what you'll see across all the patients that you see in clinic. And then CLL was not necessarily a part of this study, um, even though many would argue it's really just an, uh, an indolent lymphoma, uh, but it also works there too and has been compared uh, uh, with rituximab uh, in that setting as well. And so based on this, I think it's fairly easy to see that obinutuzumab um, is here, uh, that it's effective, it's FDA approved, and that it should be used uh, in most cases for patients with a lymphoma who uh, are felt to need CD20-directed therapy. So thank you very much.